Welcome back to Maps with Trent. Um, as always, let me know if the sound levels are all off. Um, I'll also make this video a little less bizarre looking in a second. Uh, first, a PSA um, to do with the times at the moment in the US. Maybe you already know, but if you don't, um, please don't repost videos of black people being killed. Um, it only makes more trauma, and if what you're worried about is awareness, there's much better ways of doing it that aren't going to traumatize more people and bring up horrible situations that are going on. So if you want to talk about that more, I'm super open to talking the DMs anywhere. Um, but um, yeah, please, just think about how, those, how it could affect other people first, before posting those things. With that out of the way, um, today we're going to talk about Crow, and it has a few new input modes that I think make the module able to do so many different things um, that I'm really excited about. And um, yeah, so I'm just going to kind of walk through a bunch of different ideas as to how we can kind of use them to do interesting stuff. Um, that little intro interlude, I was actually cheating. There was no... Um, there was no crow involved, just two cold max, a sisters, and a mangrove. Um, but I think it's kind of an interesting jumping off point for doing some really cool audio processing stuff a little later on. Um, but we'll get there. So we'll get to that stuff in, in crow a bit later. Um, but yeah, uh, one other thing. I'm going to set a timer for 5 o'clock, and then we're going to take a 5 minute break, just because I feel like these things have been... Uh, sometimes I rabbit on, <laughs> so this will hope maybe hopefully help. Five o'clock. Come on. Okay. Um. Okay, let me see if I can get us a more appropriate situation. Ah. Let me grab... Copy. Okay, here we are, somehow. For some, I, I recently upgraded my operating system to not even the newest Linux, and it's like everything is just all messed up. Um, so please bear with me. Things are a little strange on my side at the moment. I'm a little confused. <laughs> all right, let's let's change this. Uh... What color is the color? Is the green screen something like that? That's definitely better. It's still strange. Uh, yes. All right. Now you don't have to worry about me hiding off in the in the background. Um. Ooh, we can bring up. Wow! Everything looks so bizarre. Does it still work? Yeah, cool. Uh, something like this. We're just gonna go for the. Uh, oh, that's. I'm gonna have to save that. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me today. I thought I was very well prepared, but apparently it was not true. Thankfully, my video is so terrible quality that you can't tell how sweaty I am right now. <laughs> it's incredibly hot in New York City. Hi, Brian. Um, okay, cool. Where to begin? 
where to begin? Somewhere along here. Crow is disconnected. Let's change that. Is that this? That's this one. Anger. Sorry, I'm a little uh, out of sorts in this moment. We'll get there. <sighs> All right, fine. I'll upload last week's video. Just uh, wait until after this one. I was a little self-conscious about it. I felt it was a bit uh, meandering. But I'll post it until I get seven downvotes, and then I'll take it down again. Cool, okay, um, let's begin. Um, I'm gonna start by asking, well, I guess we can ask in this crow, we can, I'm gonna check what version the module's software is, firmware. Gives me this delightful commit number. It's probably, uh, um, it's probably fine. We'll see, we'll find out very quickly. Um, I'm just going to do this to check. Oh, cool. Okay, so we have this. Do we have that? Yeah. Do we have this? Do we have that? No. Okay. That's fine. We'll get there. Um, all the figuring out on the fly. That's, that's kind of how I roll. That's why it goes for two hours and not 45 minutes. <laughs> I really want to change my uh, my filtering on my video right now to uh, make it make me look less like a carrot. Uh, it always messes with the um, with the green screen though. Low stress. <laughs> We're all sweaty. Ain't that the truth then? Does this still work now? Yeah. Cool. All right. Great. Desaturate. Desaturate. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do a quick run through of the existing modes of things. Uh, just because it's actually going to help me remember, which I feel like is often one of the important things. Um, all right, should be. Let's let's start from here. Okay, great. Um, so as it stands. Crow has two inputs, and you can currently use them in, in three ways, one of which doesn't feel like a way or a mode, but it is, in my mind, still one. Um, maybe I'm going to set up a, a, just a basic patch to, to get things rolling along here. Oh, sorry. Um, keep that.
Okay. Um, so I've just got a basic patch going. Um, and all it is is an oscillator into the three sisters filter um, to the output. Nothing very complicated. Um, what we have at the moment is Crow controlling the frequency and the volume of the mangrove. So we can set um, the voltage of the output to be, well, this is not really going to, you're not going to hear it yet. Um, and that's the pitch and then output two, this is our volume. So five is going to give us five volts. We can go up to 10. Um, and then we can change the, the octave this way. Ooh, that's nice. Um, so that's great. Now, what we might want to do is just take the, take the voltage at the input and pass it through to one of those outputs. So that's really simple. We can do that uh, with a stream. Why you'd want to, I'm not sure, but we'll get to that later. Um, so we can say, um, can I do this all in line? Let's let's make a let's make a file to start with, a little sketch to kind of get things rolling. Um, so we're gonna do inputs. We're gonna call this. Uh, let's work with a black screen today. I, I'm feeling that kind of vibe. Um, so we'll start by using a function called init. Well, first we're going to give it a name. Um, exploring crows input modes. So in our init function, we're going to basically turn on the input, um, the input mode called stream, and we're going to run it. Uh, as fast as possible. This is the magic number that means as fast as possible. 0 0.0015 seconds or 1.5 milliseconds. Maybe that's not correct. Maybe it's 0.6. Anyway, this is beside the point. Input1.stream is a function that gives us a value. So this is just tying together the input stream mode and this function here is an event handler that basically takes that on a timer gives us a new value constantly. So let's just send it to output two. Um, yeah, output two volts equals val. And now we can run this. Um, and now we have this cold Mac survey knob controlling the volume. That's not super exciting, but it is, it's using the value and it's getting it, it's kind of moving the voltage through. I'm going to try and bring the, uh, bring the modular a little closer so we can see things a bit better. Hopefully it doesn't make my computer turn off like it's been uh, doing a bit of recently. All right, we got a little bit more, a little more visibility. Cool. Great. Okay, so all we've done here is we've shown how you can map an input to stream its value to the output. Um, and that's happening. It feels continuous when I'm turning the control. But it's actually only happening at a regular kind of time base. Um, but it's fast enough that it feels like continuous. Uh, the next thing we can do is um, maybe we, instead of controlling the volume continuously, we just want to kind of have an on and an off state. So to do that, we're going to use the mode called change. Uh, I'm not going to put any parameters in here. We're just going to use the default change. Um, 
and that's going to look pretty much the same, except we're going to set up a function on the, called input one dot change. Uh, so it's a function, and this is going to give us a state. And so that's going to be a Boolean value. It's going to say whether we're true or false, high or low. Uh, and with that, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to set the vault, um, but I'm going to use a, an and or statement in Lua, which is like a ternary statement in other languages, where we say if state. So that um, I just use the parens here to show myself that it's a, a Boolean statement. Um, basically, that it's, that it's about logic rather than about... Um, rather than being a continuous value. It's like saying, like, this is going to give me a true or false. Um, and uh, 8 or 0. And that should... Let's try it out. So what we're doing there is we're jumping between the output voltage of... 8 volts and 0 volts. And that's basically happening... You probably can't see, but it's a little bit... It's between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock. And that's because there's a, defe a default threshold where that transition happens. We can change that by modifying this... Um, modifying this setup call. We can instead give it a threshold, which is going to look like... We can say 2 volts. So that could just be it. It doesn't have to be a floating point number. And it's subtle, but it's moved the position where the transition happens. Um, we could make this 4 volts, so it only happens right before the end. Um, this is setting that threshold is more interesting, I think, when you're triggering it with something that isn't a continuous voltage. Um, so we could use a, let's use the Just Friends, for example. Out of where have all my patch cables gone? This is the perennial question. Is that a long one? Yeah. So here I'm just using the I'm using a just friends just as a clock uh, for now. Um, but what's interesting about this is that it's using a envelope to trigger the input. Um, and because it's very, it's because it's sensitive to what voltage, we can change basically the point in the cycle where it'll flip. So channels of just friends. Um, one is controlling Mangrove's format directly to change its um, timbre, and the other is going into Crow. That we're seeing right there. But we'll notice that if we change what this threshold is, it'll it'll change the sound because it'll change when the volume goes higher. So just note that like. The mangrove is turned on almost the whole time. Whereas, we could set this to just get turned on. And we just get that little, that little buzz of mangrove. And this is going to be sensitive to the waveforms. sounds in there but uh it's a it's a thing it's, it's kind of interesting to use the threshold not just to say um yeah not just what level to trigger at but to use it in a way to kind of say i have this envelope and do i want to trigger 
like right before I get to the top or do I want to trigger just as soon as we start? And if you have like a long sloping envelope, that can be an interesting way to kind of change the um, the shape and the feeling of that trigger. You know, you can basically push it back in time if you're basing it off of an envelope. So that's the basics. Um, I said there was three ways. The other way is that you can simply query the input value. So here we have change, but I can also just say when the script runs, um, when the script runs, for example, you can put this in a timer, but when the script runs, um, set the output voltage equal to ah, the input voltage. Um, so what that's going to do is basically just sample the value that's on the just friends. Um, and it's just going to stay there the whole time. It's not very exciting, but um, we could run that to show this point, we could run that same line of code in Druid, in the REPL. And... So yeah, I just did it again and it like got ma massively louder. And so doing that is just, just a way to say that you can like... Um, you can always access the input value of Crow, no matter what it's doing, no matter what mode you're in, um, or which of these things we're going to talk about today, you've always got access to the actual voltage on the jack um, by just calling input uh, square brackets one dot volts. That'll give you the voltage, regardless of what else is going on, even if you're using one of the fancier modes we're about to talk about. Um, yeah, so that's where we start. Uh, so the next point, well, the first, the first kind of new feature that I want to talk about is um, this idea of, it's called window. And window is, it's very similar to change, but it's kind of one layer more complexity. So um, change is often, t is really a, a comparator, it's called. So what that means is you have a threshold voltage where once you cross the voltage, if you go above, um, it's one level, and if you go below, it's a different level. But there's like this, this hysteretic section in here where it says, uh, which basically means it makes it so that once you cross into the next level, you actually have to come back this extra amount before you cross into the other, like before you return. So what that means is if you have a really, um, a vibra like a, an oscillating thing that's really tiny, superimposed on a big one, it's not going to like jitter around the um, that transition point. Instead, it'll it'll go down, 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 jump across, and then the point to jump back is actually going to is going to shift away from it. That's a bit of a long-winded way to say this is um, a concept that can be applied outside of just two states. You can also apply it to any number of states. And the, the first two modes we're going to talk about both kind of do this thing, but they kind of, they do it with a different mentality. Um, so the first one is called window. Um, I'm going to try and just and uh, do this freely, um, but we might, I might need to reference some documentation. It's always nice when you write yourself documentation. Um, so uh, let's... Let's do the old push it off the bottom of the page. Um, we're going to start again. And this one is going to be pretty much the same. Input one dot mode. But here we're going to call window. And window, um, what it's going to do is take, it's going to take a table of different thresholds. So to do the same thing as change, you could just give it a, a table with a single value, um, which we could say is, is one. Right, um, 
I think that's all we need. That's all we need to get it running. So we're just going to show that we can make the same thing happen as change. Um, and so now we need to define the window function for input one. So we're going to say it's equal to a function, and this is going to give us an index. Um, or a window, the number of the window. And just for argument's sake, I'm going to just print that index. And let's hope that it works. Ooh, okay, so we see something. Um, I'm gonna change, we're just gonna go back to using cold Mac. And so you probably still can't see the, the dial on here, but as I turn the volume, the, the, the knob below um, one volt, uh, we see a one printed, and as I turn it up, you see a two. And that's kind of just gonna be dynamically in response to turning that knob. So that's not very exciting. That's exactly the same thing as we had before. Um, what we can do though, is we can add more windows. So um, this here is going to give us three windows. So there's two values, which means we can be below it, in between, or above. Um, I guess that was backwards to you, I'm sorry. Um, but now, as I turn this control, we're currently in uh, zone three. When I get around 12 o'clock, we go to zone two, and then down further is zone one. Um, window has one more capability, which is it can tell you which direction it's going. Um, so there's an optional argument here. Uh, called direction, so we'll just print that as well. Um, I think. Okay, and so we just, I just like scrolled through and we're up into number three, and we're seeing three true. What that means is um, true is, is like true and false in change. It's a state, it's saying high or low. Um, so true means we're rising. So I went from two into three. Um, so I get a true value, but if I go from three into two, I get a false. Um, so see, you can see there that I've, I've got two different instances of two, like um, state number two, but, um, but one's true and one's false because one rose into it and the other fell into it. Um, mid-century modular, can you change the input mode dynamically? Uh, you can just reassign it. There's no discontinuity. So you can just basically call mode again. There shouldn't be any discontinuity or anything that happens. Um, okay, so that's kind of something. What I, the main reason I was wanting to use this is I had this idea where I wanted to use a CV parameter, um, so either a control voltage or just a knob to basically uh, select different scales, select different mappings, um, select like basically a different function to apply between uh, two inputs or different uh, modality. And you can do that with, um, with the stream input, but it's, it's not the best because you have to write a bit more code, um, but also you you kind of have to maintain some state. If you want to know the directions and things, it's a little bit uh, more complex. So by just um, this one line of code, um, I now have basically... Oh, I mustn't have saved it. Yeah. Um, I now have basically a five zone selector. To me, it's interesting. Um, but the one and an interesting, another cool thing is that um, you can use that, you can use the kind of true false, the rising falling to do other things. Um, but why don't we use it simply to be like an octave selector? Um, so we can do that by instead of printing it, we're going to send it to the output. Uh, you can say output one volts equals uh, index. And 
index always starts at one because Lua always counts from one. So one is going to be the lowest um, value, but I want to treat the middle point, the number number three as, um, as zero. So let's subtract three. Uh, and we'll turn this mangrove back up. I'm going to take out this uh, modulation. To me, it's fun. It's a nice little... Uh, simple way to write, uh, basically take an input and turn it into an octave uh, selected output. So that's like a, it's like a little utility patch, but I think it could be interesting and useful um, in some contexts. Um, I think I had an idea here. Oh, there's a couple of different things we can do. The first is let's show using the direction. So what I'm going to say is simply um, if direction Oh, we can, we can do a ternary again. We're going to say output one. Output one? Is that really correct? Oh, yeah, pitch. Sorry. Um, this is kind of a boring thing we can do, but let's, let's do it this way. Um, slew is going to be if the direction is true. So if we're rising, we're going to set the slew to be instant. Um, otherwise, we're going to set the slew to be 0.1 seconds, just to demonstrate this, this kind of functionality. So you see we just jumped up uh, exactly, but now as we come down, we get these slews. So that's that. Uh, another question. Can you get the max number of window states? The best thing to do um, is uh, something I've been, I've been doing a little bit when I've been exploring this stuff, is to actually define the table separately. So say um, thresholds equals um, this table, and then just use thresholds. Um, and then down here, you can find out the number of potential options with thresholds plus one. Um, that'll give you how many choices there are. So that's a way we just, I just wanted to keep the, uh, the event handler itself a little bit simpler. Um, because basically uh, the system can't really handle passing around this table all the time. Um, so instead, if you want to, if you want to maintain kind of knowledge of that, you have to save it separately. Um, but yeah, so that's um, that's the kind of the the basic use of the window handler. Um, another idea that I was just thinking about earlier. Um, I'm gonna save this as window one. Um, another idea is instead of um, like as a, a voltage selector. What I'm going to do is use it as a um, basically allowing you to take two different triggers and analyze them with the same input um, by using one in an inverted state. So we're going to have one triggered at minus four and another at plus four. I hope this works. I haven't I haven't patched this yet. Um, and I'm going to return these back to just being a print. Uh, now we have to do some patching. So the idea is I'm going to use a just friends to create some trigger pulses by just using uh, square wave mode with a really short, um, really short ramp time. And I'm going to take one of them. Oh, this cable's too short. Oh, I have a. Just a uh, cold map right here. Okay, so we're going to take one output 
and process it directly. I'm going to plug it into the offset of, of Cold Mac, and that's going to basically just pass it through to the left and right. Um, in this case, I'm going to use... Is this how it works? Somebody help me here. Do I have to plug it into Fade? I... Sometimes I wish I knew these modules better than I do. Something like this. To me, this seems good. <laughs> uh, so we're just seeing some data kind of printed up on the screen. Um, and I'm going to ignore state number two, which is the middle state, which is kind of a, no a do-nothing state. Um, what we want to say is, if the index is one, then it's a negative trigger. Else if index, I can do else if, right? Else if index equals three, then positive trigger. So in one case, let's say um, the output one volts, we'll set it to zero, and we're going to we're going to call the second output with an attack release generator. Um, whereas if we go if we get a positive trigger, instead I'm going to set the voltage to the 1 volt, so it'll go up an octave, and I'm going to turn on an LFO at a kind of basic basis rate. So let's try that out. I'm not sure if you can see, but basically those two states are transitioning whenever we see the two different triggers here light up. Um, so they'll kind of interplay back and forth, but it's an interesting uh, interesting approach. Yeah, so I'm not using, I'm not doing stack cables, I'm just, I'm using Cold Mac to do um, a kind of cheat mix, which is plugging one trigger into fade and another trigger into offset. And basically, the one into offset will stay positive, and the one into fade will get inverted um, because of the way the circuit works. It's just, it's a trick. Um, but you could use any, any inverter um, will allow you to do this. And I know it's not a big thing, but it allows you to basically use two independent triggers on one jack in a way that's pretty reliable. Um, so that's that patch. Um, there's oh yeah that's it that's uh so that's that's window um um yeah so i mean it's it's more of a utility mode but it makes writing certain kinds of ideas a little more um, elegant than using stream and then having to kind of do all this casing all of a sudden. It's also a lot more performant. So um, as your script does more and more, it's not going to get stuck doing some kind of basic stuff that this can handle automatically for you. Um, I'm going to take one moment. I remember I didn't read all these initial comments, but here we go. Okay, um, so that's the first one. How are we doing for time? Wow, okay, I'm going way too slow. Uh, that's window. So let's let's make a new file. Oh, why am I doing that? Um, I'm just going to save... That's what's being saved. Oh, as inputs. I want to save it again as uh, window one.
We'll make it another two. Cool. Okay. Um. I was anticipating that we'd like run out of uh, lines in the script before it stops working, which is why I was doing this. But we'll see. Um, okay, next one is reminiscent uh, of the output scaling that I demoed in the first uh, the first maps episode. Um, but this one, instead of being an output mapping of like from a from a continuous uh, output signal into a quantized set of steps. Here, we're going to apply a scale to the input. So, it's called scale mode. Input, scale. And here, the numbers are a little, they might be a little opaque at first. Um, but, there's a number of defaults and a number of things that are the kind of um, the basis for everything that should kind of at least give you a starting point and you don't uh, need to reference the documentation constantly. I think that means that you don't have to give it any arguments to start with, and it'll do something. Um, like everything else, we're going to define our event handler, which is going to look like this, and it's just going to give us this magical uh, parameter called s. And this is because basically there's um, a number of different ways that you can think about quantization and you can think about what do I want to do with a scale? Um, or what does it mean to quantize an input? And it depends on what you want to what you want to do with that value. So the three categories we're going to talk about are when you want to take a continuous input and you want to map it to a scale and directly control a voltage or a synthesizer um, with I2C. Um, so in that case, basically all you really care about is the correct voltage for the quantized step you're in. Uh, that's kind of that's the way that most modular quantizers are going to work. You know, you, you want to know the only thing you ever care about in modular is the voltage because what else can you do apart from kind of modulate things based on the voltage. So that's the first mode we can do. The second mode is we can treat it more like a um, the most the most boring one is we can kind of treat quantizing as capturing a voltage and turning it into a MIDI number. Um, so that's the next step. Basically, we treat we can kind of treat them as semitones. Um, so that's kind of getting into a twelve tone kind of. Uh, context, like a base, a kind of traditional music context, but it's cool because then you can like send that to norns or you can send it to max and you have like a, a MIDI ready note kind of um, already going. Um, that's actually the default. Um, so even if we, I think if we don't define an event handler, there is a default event handler. So this will just send um, a scale message to norns or to max. And also, it's going to show up in Druid, we hope. Yeah, look at that. Wow, okay, those numbers don't seem correct. <laughs> Classic. There could potentially be some things wrong with the defaults, but we'll get there. Um, you know, let's just try this. Alright, that's halfway, but I'm going to go for another five minutes, and then we'll figure it out. Okay, so... Let's break this patch down again, make it simpler again. Um, oh, I didn't mean to pull that out. Um, pitch. So, um, we're going to go again using just the cold Mac. Um, and as we turn the knob, ooh, we're actually getting volts. So this is interesting. Um, this is giving us pretty much the same thing as we were getting with window. Um, but this is not really what I want to show you. What I want to do is say, um, I think it's this. I'm just going to put in some numbers, then I'm going to explain them in a second. Um, 
Oh, maybe because it's an empty table. Let's jump straight into doing the scale. Um, just to further reiterate my point, I'm going to use the same scale I always use. <laughs> well, one of them. Um, okay, great. So, you'll note, as I'm turning the cold Mac knob, um, we're seeing, without writing any event handler, we're getting this special message. Uh, this is called a, a kind of a crow command. Uh, it's not even a command. It's like a basically a special form of command that we're using over serial to communicate between um, between crow and norns or between crow and max. And they're basically prepended with these kind of two carrots, which Br Brian's original uh, brilliant idea was that it looked like a crow. And I was like, oh, okay, it's beautiful. Love it. So we kind of adopted it as the the crow, fancy crow message. In this case, whenever we do that, whatever comes after it is just the Lua command. So it's not implemented yet, but in Norns um, and in Max, there's going to be a new kind of handler. So this there's, there's an automatic function that gets called when you send it this. And these numbers might seem not like MIDI numbers because they have negative values, but um, all you have to do is basically add a couple octaves to it. Uh, maybe I think you add 36 or 48. Um, but basically, um, I'm having a hard time. There we go. So zero volts is going to equal MIDI note number zero. So that's going to be your kind of your basis point. You can then in your program kind of shift that by however many octaves you want. But this is a really simple way to take a quantized input and turn it into a MIDI number directly. I got sidetracked. I was meant to tell you that there's a third way we can use it, which is to do some fancy kind of remapping of scales. Um, if anybody's used the scale MIDI um, in Ableton, uh, Ableton Live, there's a, there's an, uh, what, what are they even called? A device called scale, which allows you to kind of remap scales and do some interesting stuff. But we can do we can do it in a similar way, um, but with text code, with Crow. Um, and we can do it without ever having to go into a computer or into a into a desktop or a laptop. Um, but let me walk through this very quickly. So we have this scale command. The first parameter it takes is a, a list. And this list is going to be, um, at least for right now, it's you can think of it as semitones, but that'll that'll come later. The default is that it is semitones. In fact, we don't need these numbers here, and this should work identically. Yeah, there we go. Great. Um, so yeah, you can think of this here as just being a scale, and and we're treating zero as being kind of C or whatever root chord you're in. It's basically zero volts is going to equal the number zero. Um, these numbers don't have to be integers, so you can do micro-tuning um, by making this 2.1 or 2.54, whatever, um, if you want to get into that territory. Um, and then the second argument to this function, these are all optional, so you don't have to put them in if you don't need. Um, so that's your basic scale quantizing. Uh, next, we can say 12. So there's 12 steps in our scale. And that's the default. That's what we're already using, but we just didn't have to type it. If instead we change this to say another number, 19, um, this array, this table of values is now being treated as a 19 step equal temperament scale. Um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think it's something like this doesn't seem correct, but um, something like this is going to give us like a, a pentatonic, so, so it is a pentatonic scale, it's five notes, um, but a 19 tet tuned one. Um, that's not really going to help us much right now because we're just looking at the numbers, so why don't we apply it to an output voltage? Um, so that's going to look like this, we're going to say output one volts equals s, our magic parameter, dot volts. So that's just, just saying um, 
the scale has returned a value. I've like gone into a new note zone um, and I just want to get it as a vault kind of signal. And that should be all we need to do. So here I'm just using... a continuous control signal to basically slew through a scale. Um, so that's the kind of basic way to do it. Here, so it's cool being able to have access to these alternate tunings um, and alternate kind of equal temperament steps. There is, I want to do just intonation kind of support, but it's going to come later. Um, and then there's one more parameter, which is the vault per octave scaling. And what that means is you can do, there's two things you can do. One is you can support alternate uh, tuning systems like Buchla stuff. Buchla gear requires 1.2 volts per octave. So you just give it as, a, as the, the next argument. This is gonna sound a little strange. Obviously because uh, this oscillator tracks one volt per octave, not 1.2. Um, but that's all you have to change. Uh, but another thing you can do with this alternate mapping is you can provide scales that wrap over two octaves. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say I have a two octave scale. And in that two octaves, I have still have 24 steps. So it's like two regular equal temperament octaves. Um, but instead, I can give it a scale that operates over two octaves where the second octave is different from the first. So this is, I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a harmonic, a hum, a melodic minor scale where it like changes on the way down, except it's just going up continuously in, in a different way. Um, ha ha ha, 19 tet sounding normal, I got you. So, um, what was it, 17? And what's the 6? Oh, what am I even trying to say? So what, what, I'm, what I'm entering here is a major extended arpeggio. So we have the root, the third, the 7, sorry, the root, the third, the 5, the 7, the 9, the 11, and the 13, which is 21, I think. I feel like this is getting boring, me just turning the knob. We can, we can patch it. playing at least a conceptually kind of more complex thing than just a scale. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of uh, that general use. Um, we could also use this to play Just Friends. Um, I think it's the same one that's in Just uh,
transient mode. Um, I need a different modulation source. Let's use this. I should have to apologize to all my patch cables. so quiet. Oh, it's because we're in doing this. And that big, the big stab chord, um, is when it's going from the top, ramping right down really quickly to the bottom. It's like hitting a bunch of these different notes and it'll kind of sp spatter them all out. That's because Just Friends isn't quite an instant drop down, it has like a little slew. Yeah, S is the table with some different representations. I'm about to get into this, the secondary ones. Um. sine wave, it's like in a, 
don't know if it's long or exponential, but it kind of changes the spacing of the notes. Yeah, some kind of like magical quantizer stuff going on. Um, the next thing we can do is by using the other functionality in S. So I'm talking about this this parameter here, S, um, and it's special because it gives you like vaults like this, but it will also give you um, S dot note and also give you S dot index. Oh, and so I'm gonna have to look up how to use these, I forgot. I'm gonna steal this this one line here. Um because I think this is where it gets really interesting. Um So let's try it out. Make that a bit quieter so I can think. <laughs> um, okay, so this is kind of working with a number of different concepts here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put our scale into, into a variable. So what I've done there is I've just kind of, in, instead of writing the scale in directly into the input setup, I've, I'm passing a variable and that variable is a representation of a scale. We'll, we'll keep the same one for now because I think it, it sounds nice. Um, oh, maybe, actually I'm going to change it to be a 12 turn just because um, it'll make some of the math a little easier to think about when it's only ever one octave. Um, yeah, so from here, um, we can use, we'll turn this stuff back on in a second. But um, what we're going to do is we're going to set the output voltage um, to equal basically my scale. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to look back at our, our scale that we quantized against. Um, but instead of using it as is, we're going to kind of do some like arithmetic to kind of jumble it up. Um, so let's let's start with just um, s dot index. this will okay so that's how we have a four note scale it's just an arpeggio um oh yeah just to comment yes the threshold is the threshold is set up so the middle of the note um it has like equal amount of space on either side of it output the output voltage that it gives you it has like a window on either side and like it's all captured into that one okay so what we're doing here is capturing s dot index which is like a um, basically telling us which number of item we're looking at in this scale so in this case it's going to be one two three or four and so all we're doing here is we're going to use that number to look up back into the scale itself um, and then divide it by 12 because we know we're working with a 12 tone scale. This is identical to this line. These two have the exact same functionality. One gives you a voltage directly, the other one we're kind of calculating the voltage. We can prove that by simply uploading, uploading it again. Okay, there's one difference and that is when you use index, you don't have the octave. So we can get the octave back by simply adding s dot octave. So we'll see these two 
two of the same. Great. Um, so what we can do now is we can do some interesting stuff where we can kind of treat the scale tone separate from which octave we're in. And so maybe we want to give octave octaves a different kind of meaning than simply going up in tones. You know, maybe as we maybe we want to just use a single octave, but we want to say if s dot octave is greater than two. S octave is greater than 2, then output 2 um, plays an envelope. So only when it's getting up to that higher octave, it's spitting out that extra like pulse, um, which is giving that this attack release. But we can do something, I think, more interesting. Um, the octave back. So this will give us a sliding through the scale. And then instead of just using the index, let's let's change the index, right? So we can do that by the, the example I have above is to basically flip the scale. Um, so we're going to take the length of a scale, which in this case is four. Um, going to then subtract the index, which is a number between 1 and 4. So that's going to give us 0 to 3. Um, so the problem is we, uh, we have to start counting at 1 in Lua, so we have to just add 1 to that. And this... So we're still going up the scale, but within each octave, we've flipped all the notes. I really like this one. To me, it's a nice sound. I'm just going to bring back the Just Friends and Mangrove together. Not to forget that uh, you can do two of these at once with Pro, and they can have different scales. Um, yeah, so you can do some really interesting kind of overlapping stuff, different scales at the same time, or using the same scales but following two different CV inputs. I'm gonna take a break for three minutes. Let's say five minutes, and then we'll come back and we'll do a final roundup of everything. And look at the next mode, which is volume, um, and then hopefully we can patch up the guitar again. So yeah, hang tight, I'll be back in a sec. I'm just gonna... Thank you. 
Hi, welcome back. Was that five minutes? I feel like it was approximately five minutes. Um, okay, so we've got half an hour left. And I'm going to try and cover... We're going to try and do one more input mode. Um, and then I'm going to talk briefly about, there's two further, um, one of which is pretty much working and the other is, um, maybe working. I'm not sure. Um, but they're all kind of interesting and they're all interesting because they relate to audio signals, not just control signals. They're not just events, but they are, um, analysis of a kind. Like obviously this stuff is analysis too. It's analyzing um, signals for different kinds of change, different kinds of kind of content. Um, but these ones look at a an audio waveform instead of a just a static voltage. So the first one is called volume, um, and we're gonna start by looking at that. So at this point, I'm just kind of going through um, a bit of boilerplate that is kind of pretty much natural for all of them. So we just we have an init function, we turn on volume mode, and then we create an event handler for volume. Um, and this is where we have to talk about what this is. Um, so volume gives you a A value which is um, which is kind of like voltage but it's a it's essentially an RMS voltage meaning that it's uh, when you send it a a DC yes volume is new this is not this is in the current master but it's not um it's it's not in it's not publicly it's not like in the main official release yet coming very soon um, just like scale uh, and window. So it's going to give us a volume metering. Um, so here we can call this, uh, let's call it level. Um, if you send it a static voltage, um, say DC, it's going to return eventually that voltage. It has a bit of a settling time. Um, oh, at Charles 11. Um, this actually, you need to, you'll need to update to the newest firmware. Maybe I should walk everybody through. Okay. So this is not for, a, this is not for the, um, unadventurous, but I will show you how you can update. Um, oh no. how you can update your crow to the current most, um, most most fanciest version. <laughs> I know that doesn't make any sense, but bear with me. Okay, so here we have a, a web browser. Um, I, this is going to be here. So you'll want to go to the Crow um, GitHub page. Why did that? Here we go. Okay. Um, my computer is in slow motion for some reason. This is a bit strange. You want to go to, you want to click on uh, this button up here called Actions. I think this is what you have to do. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. If you click Actions, this will give you a bunch of, bunch of things that might seem quite strange. Just look at the first one, as long as it says Master. Um, you, you want to find the, the one closest to the top that says Master. And then from here, um, you can click on it. So this is going to show you the newest build of, um, of Crow. This is all built kind of automatically by the GitHub system, um, that the, kind of that our team set up. And all you need to do now is click on this button here. And this will download 
this binary file. It's a long, long-winded thing. Um, if you open it, all that's inside is this, is this uh, crow.bin file. Now this file is, um, it's exactly the same as what comes in the official firmware download. So if we look back at the crow page where we would normally, you would normally click on this releases button up here. Uh, you can't see that. You click on releases. Um, and this is like the most the official with everything in it. Um, and you just click on this zip file down here. It'll download. Um, but this one's a bit different. This has a, a folder and inside of it, it has all this stuff. The easiest thing to do is, is grab the current one, unzip it, and just copy in the new crow.bin into that folder, <laughs> crow dot, crow.bin into that folder. Um, I can't do it here because these are, this is not, this is an archive manager, not a window manager. Um, but that's all you have to do. And then you just run the upload update firmware like normal. Um, I don't recommend it for the lighthearted, um, or anybody who wants the thing just to work, but that's, if you really want the bleeding edge, you can do it right now. That's how. But coming back, you can just treat it as a, uh, um, as like an, uh, a teaser. So yes, volume, back to volume. It's essentially the same as stream mode, except it does an analysis over the input uh, and gives us a, an RMS style vol volume. Um, so what we're gonna do with that is we're just gonna use it essentially as a, an envelope follower and we're gonna, we're gonna apply it directly. So output one, uh, let's use two because we're doing volume on two. Um, vaults equals level. Like stream, this mode can take an argument for how fast, um, but we, we shouldn't, let's just leave it as is for now. Let's see what happens. Um, so the first thing we need is a signal to follow. Um, what I'm going to say we can do is, is that running now? Cool. I'm going to use this just friends in plume mode. That should be it, right? I'm confused why this is not working correctly. Um, I'm going to do the old restart. <laughs> Are we back? Yeah, looks good. Ooh. Okay. Um, yeah, so... This is the classic situation where I don't remember how to use my own modules, but we persist somehow. Okay, so what's happening here is I have a clock over here. I'm using Just Friends, but I have a clock. It's triggering this Just Friends in plume mode. And so that's basically having Just Friends output an oscillator with a with a kind of envelope shape attached to it. Um, it's like a default a default shape. You can modulate it a little bit. Um, so rather than listen to this directly, um, I, I want to take that output, and we're going to oh, we already have a cable. We're going to analyze it. Um, and we're going to, ooh, crow disconnected.
Love this. Sorry, one second. Oh no. What could be causing that? Just one more time, for good measure. Okay, we're back. Um, so yeah, we're, we're basically, we're gonna try and monitor the volume of that, that pulse. We'll get to doing, um, not just synthesizer stuff with that soon, but um, that's what we'll start with. Um, and then we're gonna send that out as a voltage on output two. which in order to hear, we have to plug it in. Okay. So um, I'm not sure whether it's working yet. So I'm just gonna print in here the level. So it's kind of working, um, but you'll note it sounds a little jittery. And I think that's because the default polling rate is about 10 milliseconds. So let's try decreasing that. We'll take it down to one millisecond and see if things get better. Yeah. So we're basically tracking the volume of this Just Friends input and mapping it directly um, via crow into a, oh, it's not going to like printing like that. <laughs> um, yeah, we're mapping the volume of that signal into a new control voltage. Um, so that's an envelope follower at its most basic, but we can do some other cool stuff with that. Like we can basically... We can follow it directly, but we could also use it as an input into like a slew generator, um, which is kind of, you can do that with a few modules, but generally it's, you have to have a CV voltage, whereas this allows you to kind of envelope follow and then do the slew stuff as well. Um, right, so let's try and do that. Let's try and make a, we're gonna slew, every time we get an updated value, we're going to slew to that value, but we're going to change depending on whether the new value is above or below where we were. This is kind of a, an ad hoc way of doing a, um, a asymmetric slew limiter. I'm not sure what you would call that. Um, it's like a direction sensitive. This is, all, this is what the kind of vectoral emula emulation is all about. Well, it's one of the key factors. Um, Okay, so here we're just applying it directly to our output. But what we want to do is also set a slew time. Um, because we, we want to slow down if we're falling. So let's say if the new level is less than the current output, Again, we, we can just query directly like this. Um, we can, in the same way that we can set the voltage by setting this volts parameter, we can just query it, it'll give us that value. And we're gonna ask if level, a new detected volume, is less than the current voltage. And if that's true, we wanna set the slew time to equal, let's make it um, a whole second. Else, let's turn slew off. It'll be instant. Um, now this is going to be a bit strange because at the moment our signal that's coming in is already a bit like that, but we can change that in a second. Let's, I'm going to patch it up so we can hear that signal as well. 
Um, okay. So it's a little quiet, but there's that pulsing in the background. And we can make it a really sharp little, little zap. Um, and then we have this kind of echoing of that. But let's increase this slew time. And you'll note that it stays high for longer. So if we slow down So, okay, we have, what do we have here? All right, I'm going to try and patch up, I'm going to try and patch up an external instrument thing. So I'm going to use a guitar to be the signal that we're going to monitor the volume of. Um, and then we're going to maybe create two or three different envelope shapes, um, all based off of the volume of the guitar signal. And then cre kind of create like a kind of a bit of a feedback patch involving that. So um, I'm using Rip here. I have a guitar. It's plugged in through a through a pedal up here, um, mostly just to boost the volume. Um, and I'm just going to use this long snap cable because it's all I've got. Okay, and we don't need to listen to this anymore. And the stack cable is going to be useful because rather than listen to the synthesizer, we're just going to listen to the instrument directly. Um, so it's just patched directly into a three sisters, um, and then the output is back to the output here. So theoretically, um, I'm just going to turn it up in here so I can hear the synth, not just the guitar. Um, how is this different from volts? Basically it means that you can have an oscillating signal um, and it won't give you those points along the curve. Instead it'll give you the average um, amplitude of that signal. So if you use like change mode and plugged in an audio signal, when you put sound in, it would give you like a as many inter it would give you as many events as possible while there was sound and then when the sound stopped it would stop giving you interrupts or stop giving you events. Um, yeah, so it's basically just so that you can you can kind of look at the Look at the signal from an abstract level of audio. Um, yeah, so it's... I, I'm not doing a great job of explaining that. But it, it means you can plug audio signals in rather than just control voltage.
Um, okay, so we have a signal. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to set up um, three sisters like a kind of like a wah pedal, if you will, um, in that it's going to use a band pass filter um, where the the level, like the sorry, the the frequency cutoff is controlled by. Um, by an envelope based on the input amplitude. So yeah, apologies for all the patching here. All right, this is turned down. Um, and we need to actually implement that. So let's just return it back to um, just taking the input and applying it to the output. Um, this feels like there's the whole instrument there. Um, signal. Cool. I'm just kind of turning up the resonance to try and demonstrate that it's... It is actually opening up that signal. Um, end of the world. Yeah, yeah absolutely, Dan. On, hit it on the head. The end of the world Western soundtrack. I think the volume on the guitar is a little low, so I'm gonna bump up, I'm gonna bump up this uh, volume by a factor of three, just to make it a really big signal. There you go. So I'm cheating here. It's not actually a bandpass filter. It's three bandpass filters. <laughs> Okay, so that's one that's one kind of thing we can do. Bump up the volume. So, uh, yeah, that's like a uh, auto wah filter effect. Um, but we could also do. Why don't we do like a Rather than just do that, let's try doing it with span as well. So this is going to take the three band passes and kind of spread them out. Uh, so it'll be like having an up and a down and a static wah all at the same time. I'm going to do that just by attaching it to output one, and we're just going to send the exact same thing to both. So this is kind of a boring way to do it, but you could just use a stack cable or something, but will be something. Too much, so I'm gonna bring it back to 1 1.5. <laughs> <laughs>
But we can do some more interesting stuff. We don't just have to do the volume following. I have a note here for something interesting. Ooh, okay, so. That's great, that gives us uh, amplitude following like normal. Um, but what about doing something different? What about a way to encourage myself to play quietly? And so, or to, to kind of give, give it an, a, and it, uh, what's a good word? Um, if I have a gap in my signal, to have a way of giving some inspiration. So why don't we say, if level The first thing we can do is we'll just apply an inverse amount. So I'm going to say, let's set the output 3 volts to be um, 5 minus level. And what I'm going to do with that is basically this signal is going to be, when I'm not playing anything, it'll be at 5. And then as I play, it'll get lower and lower. So I'm just going to use that to control the volume of a mangrove. And then we're going to add that into the three sisters. We'll put it on the low channel so it's just, or maybe the center so it's a little more precise where it is. Um, that looks good. Let's upload it. one kind of very basic thing we could do, but this might be more interesting if it was more like if um, we'll only turn the volume on if the level is beneath a certain point. So let's say if level is less than 0 0.5, then um, we'll set it to 5. Otherwise, we'll set it to zero. Um, and what I really want to do here is basically say, when it reaches a low point, I don't just want to turn up the volume. I might. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change to a different note. I'm going to give myself a different kind of uh, inspirational base to work off of. And so maybe, like, maybe we don't need to do it based, based on turning that signal on and off. But this is at least a start towards that idea. The idea is, uh, we're going to wait until it gets really quiet, and then, hopefully, at some point it'll turn up the volume. I think it's right on the edge of being loud enough.
Okay, cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's good enough. Um, so we can actually turn it into something more interesting. There's two things I want to do. One is basically say we're gonna have a new state variable which is gonna be called um, tone or uh, uh, new new base. Going to equal, it's going to be false. And I'm going to change this thing here. So we're going to say um, dot vault. Let's make it an actual if statement. So if level is less than this volume, this value we figured out, um, then we want to say. I basically, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to use new base as a way to make it only happen once. When it gets quiet enough, I want to like do an action, and then I don't want it to happen again until I get loud and then get quiet again. Um, so this is going to be, if we get below the value, and new base is true, we can just say is new base, um, then we're going to choose a new node. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say output three. Yeah, let's do output three. Vaults equals um, math.random. And here we can give it a range. Um, I think. I think it starts at one. So something like this. Um, 12, and then we're going to divide it by 12. So this should give us a note within an octave. Um, I hope. Um, I'm going to restructure this a little um, so that we can do the casing differently. So this is saying if we're below that level, um, I think I didn't need to do that at all, actually. Let's leave it as is. So if we get quiet and we're ready for a new base note, then we do this thing. Um, else, if level is above or equal to that value, then we're going to set new base to be true. We also in here need to say new base equals false. It's funny that I've used base, B-A-S-E. I meant B-A-S-S, -S, but here we are. And so this is just kind of doing some state uh, management so that we only do this once. It's a little bit of a runaround, but it should work, we hope. Um, and that should be it. time I play a chord or I play a figure, I'm going to have a different bass note to work off of. It's a little sensitive, but it's already given me a new note. see it kind of like jumps around and says like oh like you've stopped but you stopped doing anything interesting <laughs> I'm gonna give you some uh, motivation some encouragement some uh, inspirational advice which is just a random number but it sounds kind of interesting um, to my mind at least um, the last thing is let's just do one more of these outputs we're gonna go three multiply it by two um, but I wanted in the setup I'm going to set this to a really long slew time. I'm going to give it like three seconds of slew. On output four, it's going to have to be. Hey. And I'm going to use that to increase the volume 
like we were doing before, of that mangrove. Um, and just, just to make things easier, I'm going to pull out that, uh, that tone kind of reference. So we're just going to turn up the volume, and rather than... Rather than just listen to it, we're going to apply it as an audio rate modulation into frequency. Which is going to sound really strange. done here is I've tuned, uh, I've tuned the oscillator to match the frequency of the guitar. So hopefully, as I play, it'll kind of give me more and more as time goes by. Something along these lines. And just to make a point. I think that's it for me today. There's some more modes we missed. We missed talking about peak, uh, which is basically like an event-based volume tracker. And there is a frequency tracker, um, but it's more of a, it's more for tuning than it is for creative uses. Um, 
But we'll get to them another time. Hopefully that will be a Crow release soon. Um, when, whenever it seems like the right time. But thank you all for tuning in. I look forward to next week. Yeah, uh, send me a message. I hope you have a lovely weekend.